Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this fourth day of the Trade Credit Insurance Week organized by ICSA. My name is Richard Wolf, and I've got the pleasure of being Executive Director of the International Credit Insurance Insurity Association. Now, this event's primary objective is to increase awareness of and to showcase the trade credit insurance industry. And we're worth it. We might be small compared to other PNC lines, but we are tremendously important for the economies we live in and indeed for the world economy. This week, we have and will have a number of topics, some of strategic importance, some of geographical importance, and some focused uh, items. Now, this falls into the second category, exploring TCI in Asia. This afternoon, the last category, the focused uh, topics, we will have an example of the, the re-emergence of political risk and its, uh, its importance for our sector. You can ask questions to members of the panel. At the bottom right-hand side of your screen, you will see a button uh, questions. And I know that the panel members are dying to hear your questions. And with that, it's my honor and pleasure to introduce Hugh Berg. Hugh is the CEO of, of, uh, for Asia of COFAS, and he's been active in the Asian market since 2011, first as head of trade credit of, uh, in Asia for Aeon, then as chief commercial officer at COFAS, being promoted to the top job in the region last year in 2022. It gives me pride to say that Hugh also chairs the Asia Committee of ICESA, a committee of members that is due to meet in the second week of March 2024 in Hong Kong. And with that, Hugh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Richard. You've taken all my introductions. I don't have to introduce myself anymore. That's great. That saves me all of 30 seconds. Thank you. Um, good afternoon from Hong Kong, everybody, and uh, good morning if you're joining us from Europe. So this session um, most definitely pivots to Asia. Uh, Asia, as most of you will know, is a region that is often touted as the engine for growth in the trade credit insurance universe. Uh, the Asia trade credit insurance market is still relatively young when we compare, compare it to our European cousins. The private credit insurance market has only really been operating in Asia for around 25 or 30 years. I've made the assumption that um, the majority of our audience does have a basic understanding of credit insurance and its benefits. Um, so our job today or for over the next 15 minutes or so is to discuss the role that trade credit insurance plays in safeguarding organizations from any uncertainties of, that trading in Asia may bring and help you understand the potential opportunities and strategies to succeed. I'm very privileged to have a well-versed panel of speakers um, join me um, on today's panel. All areas of the credit insurance world is, is represented. We have Kathleen Cole, who will give us a perspective from the eyes of a reinsurer. Chloe Lin from the insurer Allianz Trade talks to us about the demand for credit insurance in Asia. Shinya Sukara. Sakara so san from Tokyo Marine talks to us about the expectations of credit insurance in a world of inflation, high interest rates and fluctuating currencies with a focus maybe on the semiconductor sector. And of course, no trade credit insurance discussion would be complete if we did, did not have the balanced voice of the broker. I'm pleased to have uh, Tyler Wendelkin from Marsh join us. Tyler will give us some insight into the availability of credit limit capacity in high demand sectors such as semiconductors and electric vehicles. So let me pause here for a second and ask each panel member to briefly introduce themselves and then we can get the show on the road. So Kathleen, if I pass to you for a 30 second brief. Sure, um, thank you, Hugh. Um, hi, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kathleen Cole from Peak Reinsurance. I'm the director for Trade Credit and Surety Underwriting, overseeing a global book with focus in APEC. And I'm currently based in Hong Kong. Very happy to be here today, joining this interesting topic panel discussion, focusing on Asia opportunities for trade credit. Yep. Done. Thank you, Kathleen. That was perfect. Chloe. 
Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Chloe Lin. I am the head of Allianz Trade for Multinational Business in Asia Pacific. Um, I've been uh, in the financial industry for over 24 years and out of which 11 years in trade credit insurance. And it's my privilege to be here and thank you for having me. Looking forward to the exchange. Thank you, Chloe. Shukada san. Hi, thank you. So, my name is Shinya Tsukada from Tokyo Marine in Nichido, based in Japan. Uh, our business is uh, mainly focused on the whole kind of business as, uh, as well as the surety. And also, the recent list of uh, single products and the pro uh, uh, including structure, the credit, and the political list nowadays. So, thank you very much for giving us, uh, giving me uh, this opportunity. Thank you, Sukada san. And last but not least, Tyler. Thanks, you. Sorry about that. I lost the signal, signal briefly there. Um, so yeah, fantastic to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation to, to join the panel here on a, on a very topical uh, subject and, and points we'll be discussing here today in this forum. So my background is I've been involved in trade credit insurance as a broker for over 20 years now, studying my career in London uh, and spending a 10 year period in the UK and the last uh, 10 years in Asia as well. I've been based in Hong Kong and now in Singapore and I've been with Marsh for close to 14 years. Thank you. Thanks, Tyler. So now you know everybody, we can move on to the main topic of the, um, of the agenda. So maybe Kathleen, if I start with you and ask for your experience of the trade credit reinsurance market in recent years, especially when we consider the impact of COVID and everything else that's happened in the world over the past three, three years or so. Sure, I'll be happy to kickstart this uh, discussion. Um, I think although glo global uh, economic growth uh, is projected to be um, slow to 2.8% in GDP in 2023 this year, from what we have um, of 3.4% um, in 2022, emerging Asia will still remain the fastest growing Asia uh, region, giving about 5.3%, uh, which is ahead of uh, US uh, at 1.6% and Eurozone of 0.8%. Um, Hence, we think Growth in Asia has remained broadly resilient. Domestic demand in the region has remained steady, um, even as external demand is more uncertain. Well, the ADB has forecast GDP growth in developing Asia at 4.8% for 2023, 4.7% um, for 2024, up from 4.3% in, back in 2022. Well, it shows that you know the post-COVID um, economic recovery is well underway here. Um, although we have um, global uh, weak global um, demand, which has led in, uh, to a contraction in exports and in some industrial activities in East Asia, uh, mainly China, South Korea, and Taiwan this year. But we think that domestic demand, in particular for services in Southeast Asia, is more resilient. Uh, for example, in India, uh, GDP growth forecast. Um, is of 6.4% um, in 2023 and 6.7% in 2024. The inflation shock um, is rapidly fading in Asia. Um, inflation is expected to be moderate this year and next, gradually moving closer to the pre-pandemic pre levels. Headline inflation is um, forecast to decelerate to 3.6% this year and 3.4% in 2024, um, you know, uh, which is slower than 4.4% last year. So overall, we expect Asia as a region to remain resilient. In emerging Asia, excluding China, I think we see private sector consumption and investment have remained strong. In particular, strong performance in services such as catering, hospitality, tourism has led to a swift uh, recovery in Southeast Asian economies with the sub-region projected to grow by 4.6% this year and 4.9% next year. As we are all aware that, you know, this industry has weathered many downturns and especially COVID. We have done extremely well, even better than pre-COVID times. Well, thanks to our robust risk management and flexibility in limits uh, management in certain high-risk industries, in addition, I think various uh, governmental supports have also played a vital or important role to minimize supply chain disruption during COVID. 
uh, which again well demonstrated the importance of trading that is backed by trade credit insurance meant how much it meant to the global economy. Well, on China, interestingly, China is suffering from weak domestic demand, rising youth unemployment, and increasing default of property developers. We believe um, the Chinese authorities still have many levers to deliver uh, both monetary and physical um, um, stimulus to support the real economy. Furthermore, the Chinese government has also set itself a more modest growth target for 2023 at 5.5% uh, 5, 5, 5 GDP and 4.5% next year, which remains achievable growth uh, given that first half GDP growth um, is, is already at 5.5%. Inflation in China is declining faster than the rest of the region and, and, and weaker domestic consumer uh, demand. Headline inflation fell by 0.3% in July, in, mainly due to a sharp drop in the food category. Core inflation is still in the positive region um, at somewhere 0.8%. China producer price index PPI fell in July for the 10th um, consecutive months by 4.4%. But well, but having said that, um, China is still the top amongst the major exporting countries, followed by US, Germany, Netherlands, Japan, South Korea. They have generated uh, slightly more than um, 1.6 trillion in US dollar of export value in the first half of 2023, showing signs that supply chain is recovering gradually, but also at the same time facing external risk factors such, such as uh, the geopolitical issues, inflation in US and Europe, which has weakened the uh, global demand. Therefore, post-COVID, China government is working on to intensify the macro regulation, increase um, its domestic demand, boost confidence, and, exp and, 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 and ultimately is to, ex to expand China uh, economy output. Well, having a strong foothold in Asia uh, will help Pigri to benefit from the region's sustained outperformance in growth and development. While we have noticed a slowdown in the growth of China, but we believe this is more of a cyclical adjustment rather than a structural re-rating of growth. Hence, we still continue to see large opportunity, opportunity in overall Asia. That's my take on the topic. Thank you for Thank listening. Thank you, Kathleen. Maybe Chloe, if I move to you, and um, how have you seen the trade credit market develop? What's the demand for the product? Where are you seeing the opportunities and why is that? And what about product development? Um, do you see any opportunities? Yes, thanks, Hugh. Um, perhaps let me start with the few overarching themes about the opportunities ahead with TCI in Asia Pacific. Um, for the past few years, we have seen expansion in trade throughout Asia Pacific. And even with the risking happening and shifts in supply chains, uh, trade amounts market with Asia is actually set to expand. Um, the growth uh, is driven by a few key factors, which I'm going to highlight three of them, uh, the main ones. Um, first is the market trend for international trade, uh, the growing awareness uh, for needs for TCI, especially in the new markets, um, and working capital requirement that's uh, related to the TCI. And first, uh, I'd like to start with the expansion in certain growth area, uh, markets like China, South and Southeast Asia. China has been uh, playing a critical supplier role uh, for US and EU and vice versa. And the regulatory landscape also to be more pro TCI, as we noticed that the uh, Chinese government has opened the export uh, credit license to insurance company locally. So um, we see Chinese uh, uh, market is still a potential for us to grow further. And moving to ASEAN, we see growing in demand for TCI in countries like Vietnam and Indonesia. And we saw many Chinese production plants have shifted to these markets. And 
local economy growth uh, in these countries are also rising. And if we look at the our forecast, which very similar to uh, Catherine's uh, numbers, not exactly the same. Vietnam GDP forecast at 4.7% in 2023 and 65 in uh, 2024. And for Indonesia, uh, GDP forecast growth at 5% this year and 4.8% in 2024. And of course, uh, India is a big market. We are seeing significant increase in demand for trade credit insurance. Um, the number of GDP growth, the real GDP growth forecast is at 6.5, which is the highest amount of the other Asian country uh, for 2023 and 6.1 uh, in 2024. Uh, we see India, it's similar to China uh, in the very beginning where the market has a lot of potential untapped business that they don't have credit insurance cover, but they, are, uh, they have a lot of potential to grow. And secondly, uh, the companies uh, are growing their awareness and seeing the benefits of uh, values of trade credit insurance. Uh, large enterprises are looking to reduce their non-payment risk, uh, while the small and medium enterprises are looking to grow and expand to new markets. So with positive trade trends in Asia, with companies maturing in their understanding of the risk management, we see the demand for TCI appears to be robust and uh, for the next 10 years. And lastly, uh, I want to touch on the, uh, the after the pandemic, uh, the working capital requirement related to uh, trade credit. Uh, companies are looking for longer payment terms in Asia and working ca capital requirement rose by 10 days to 77 days uh, of turnover, where all the countries but Singapore face increases, ranging from two days in Japan to 12 days in India and 15 days in China. So Asia Pacific is, uh, has the second largest proportion of firms exposed to the longest day of sales outstanding. Thus, the cash flow risk, uncertainty of the risk demand are high, and we anticipate there are rooms for uptake in this market uh, with this product. And given the sizable opportunity uh, for growth in Asia, we um, remain bullish about the future and we are prepared to support our clients to growth. Uh, to this end, uh, we have diversified ability, I mean, the availability of our product and surfacing, including we uh, brought in excess of loss product solution to Asia. We are um, working on e-commerce solution and buy now pay later with clients. And we also are uh, from the multinational segment. We continue to work on tailored solution and special design credits uh, insurance solution to protect the client's cash flow and receivables. So we do have flexibility in these products to allow companies to make sure we structure the product solution to suit their business models. Thank you. Thank you, Chloe. So Karasan, if I can come to you, actually before I do that, just to remind the audience that there is an opportunity to ask questions via the chat box. So if you do have any questions for the panel members, then please feel free to, to add your question in there and we'll get to them at the end of this um, section. Um, so yeah, so Karasan, how has your market developed in recent years? What influence will high inflation, high interest rates, unstable currencies have on key global sectors such as semiconductors and the like. Yeah, thank you, Hugh. So, uh, thank you very much. So, I have been involved in the underwriting of surety and credit insurance uh, for more than 10 years at Tokyo Marine Nichido. So, uh, some of the participants here today are very familiar with the Japanese surety and the credit insurance market. And uh, I can say that uh, uh, the market has been historically stable so far. On the other hand, in the coming few years, uh, there is the possibility that uh, we will reach a major turning point in the market environment. So today, I'd like to share with briefly about the issue and uh, its impact on our industry with regard to inflationary development and changes in, changes in trade flow. First, uh, inflation. So as for the current inflation in, in Japan, it was around 3%, which is uh, still at a moderate level uh, compared with other countries. 
out for the market outlook, the rate of the increase in inflation expected to come down around 2%, although labor cost increase and the yen depreciation uh, could give an impact to actual inflation. Talking about the bankruptcies, for the last one year, last 12 months, the number of bankruptcy has been on increasing trend, returning to the before COVID level. For the number of bankruptcies this year, the annual pace is uh, 10,000 per year. This is the current situation. Reports from the credit agency's analysis on the reason for bankruptcy. This report indicated that inflationary bankruptcy are the most common reason for bankruptcy in Japan. This is due to the high raw material and energy prices and the current depreciation of the yen toward 150 yen against the US one dollars uh, is having a serious impact on the business pr uh, performance especially for the domestic demand-oriented uh, companies. Trend of the bankruptcy by sectors, services, uh, retail trade, construction, wholesale trade, and manufacturing, these sectors have all increased by between 20% and 40%, 40% if compared with the same period last year. We pay particularly particular attention to the trend in price transmission, it can be seen that the difficulty of the passing of price differs between industries. Industry with relatively high price passing on rate or steel product, paper and books, chemical wholesale, a building material wholesale. On the other hand, retail sale of daily consumer goods and or leasing and the hotel and the restaurant, these industries are looks are facing the difficulty to pass on price. This is a current, uh, this is our understanding. And uh, we pay close attention to, uh, from the our underwriting, underwriter's perspective, we pay close attention to some industry, uh, for example, the livestock industry, This sector is uh, uh, rely on the imported feedstuffs. Wholesale for food or beverages, our industry have the meaningful exposure on that sector. So oh, one point we, uh, uh, look, uh, we have concern is uh, whether they can pass on the price increase continuously in the next few years. The small and the, other than that, small and the medium uh, construction industry This sector also has the same issue, which they can pass on the price uh, increases. Lastly, apparel industry. Uh, this is also the, uh, one of the sector which we are monitoring. Uh, this sector is uh, uh, outsourcing the, outsource the production uh, to China. This is the uh, inflation uh, topics right now. So next, uh, the change in trade flow. Uh, we'd like to, I'd like to talk about the, uh, this. The export value of Japan in, in last year is about 100 trillion yen. China and uh, the United States will account for about 20% respectively. Looking at the growth rate of the export in US dollar basis, uh, China uh, export uh, uh, declined uh, by 10% and the US was almost the same as the previous year. This is indicating the actually noticeable a decline in the value of export to China. When analyzing the factors, there was a big impact uh, from the decline in semiconductor manufacturing machinery export last year. This is uh, due to the sluggish investment and the other factors related to the slowdown in the uh, Chinese economy. And the tightening control on export to China by the U.S. Department of Commerce. This is also the gave the gave me gave an uh, impact to the export from Japan. We are also seeing the negative impact from circumstances specific to East Asia, uh, such as China's restrict, current restriction on Japanese seafood import. Uh, we think they so uh, we think the trade flow from Japan is we grow, continue to change in the future. Japanese companies are expected to respond well. 
uh, to these changes in the environment by diversifying their investment business partners. But uh, uh, oh, this is a should also let, we should already for for surprising negative impact to be uh, and it's important to be flexible to change our underwriting strategy. From the different angle, we also aware of business opportunities in the Japanese market. Japanese government is promoting new investment from uh, foreign uh, capital investment in Japan. For example, uh, TSMC, new semiconductor plant is currently under construction in the south of Japan. Uh, then, uh, and Google data center of opening this year uh, around Tokyo. Including the trend of the Japanese company returning to the domestic investment, it, it is important for our industry to respond nicely uh, to, the, to this type of change of trade and investment flow. Lastly, uh, I think that uh, the economic relationship between China and Japan will never be completely separated by political politics conf conflict between China and Japan. It, it, this is my opinion, but that China will remain one of the Japan's largest trading uh, partners. We will also continue to review uh, underwriting policy and the product development uh, flexibility in response is in response to changing environment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sukarasan. Really interesting. Um, I'm just taking some notes there. I'll, I'll finish them off. Tyler, it's your turn. So from your perspective, how is the trade credit market performing certain sectors, as we know, are highly advanced in purchasing credit insurance? Is there sufficient capacity available um, to satisfy the demand? And how do private credit insurers work with the various credit export credit agencies, the ECAs across Asia? And do you see digitization having a major impact on how credit insurance is delivered in Asia in the coming years and the years to come? Thank, thanks, you. Question there, yeah? <laughs> thanks, you. Good, uh, a good array of topics there. So taking the capacity question, um, first of all, uh, I think what we see is, you know, if you're looking at inquiries coming into Asia Pacific, on an average buyer limit, the average buyer limit is much more sizable than the requests that the counterparts are receiving in Europe and in North America. And when we talk about that, we'll, we'll talk about individual buyer limits on single applicables. So it could be part of a, a standalone limit or it could be part of a portfolio. But on a regular basis here in Asia Pacific, we'll see requests in excess of $50 million on, on, on per buyer names. And that's standard. Uh, and again, that's something you won't often see within a European or North American portfolio. So the requests are getting larger and they're just becoming more numerous as well. Um, where we tend to see these higher requests, it's in a number of sectors, uh, ICT in particular. And obviously APAC is renowned for having a sizable amount of ICT, either manufacturers, distributors. Um, in the electric vehicle battery manufacturing area, electric vehicle batteries, uh, electric vehicle car manufacturers themselves, uh, the metal sector as well. Um, but just diving down a little bit into, into the semiconductor ones, because that's quite a prominent one and obviously one that um, uh, Skarsasan was, uh, was, um, was touching upon just now. Um, if you're having a look at that, four of the five largest producing countries in the world from a semiconductor perspective are based here in Asia. That's Taiwan, South Korea, Japan, and China. Um, each of them has and some related geopolitical issues, and hence that's why we're seeing someone like the US looking to increase their overall market share around about approximately 12% and take and actually uh, reshore some of the manufacturing back to the US, either on a standalone basis or in conjunction with uh, overseas manufacturers from other countries as well. Interesting enough, the, the semiconductor manufacturing level for the US market share was at 37% in 1990. So it's gone backwards quite drastically and the, the Asian countries have really dominant, dominated that space in the last 30 plus years. 
And we can see that through uh, the Chips and Science Act of 2022. There's a lot of pressure from President Biden to look to increase and reshore chip manufacturing in the US, and that's taking place. But obviously, they won't really see the full effect of that for another four to five years when those manufacturing plants are built and come online. Uh, Taiwan, for example, in the semi, uh, semiconductor manufacturing area, really benefits from a robust um, end-to-end supply chain that's been in place for a good number of years now. So collectively, they handle every aspect of the manufacturing process. Um, we often see on our role as a broker inquiries coming in at existing clients where from a semicon semiconductor manufacturing uh, perspective, either as part of the supply chain or actually the manufacturers themselves, the requests are getting more, much more sizable year on year. And that's also a challenge for the industry here, both in the private and also the ECA space. So do, I, do we feel as though there is a need for, for these limits overall and, and can the private market handle them in their current capacities with their current reinsurance in place? Um, probably for the next couple of years, but I think beyond that, because the requests are going to become even larger, um, obviously for domestic consumption, consumption within the Asia Pacific region, and then for exports into the Americas, Africa and Europe and the European Union as well. I think in due course syndications and also partnerships with the ECAs will probably have to take place to try and alleviate some of that, some of that capacity issues that we're coming up against even now and will face more so in the future. In terms of uh, electric vehicle manufacturing, um, I think what we're seeing now, and this is being realized more and more by the, the large European and, and American manufacturers, is that someone like China is uh, the biggest competitor, even though they have a, a relatively small market share. And it's their biggest competitor in that market now and growing rapidly year on year. Back in, two, uh, back in 2011, Elon Musk apparently laughed when he was asked if he considered BYD, BYD to be a uh, a competitor. However, now in, in the last couple of years, he actually reassesses his position on that and actually takes it much more seriously. In 2022, China's exports of EVs increased by 131% year on year. And in Q1, uh, the number of um, Chinese electric vehicles being manufactured increased by 30%, 37% from the prior quarter. Chinese, com uh, Chinese are actually um, coming across as better adapters, adopters sorry, of electric vehicles than they are in the US and indeed in Japan as well. So that market and that domestic consumption is really playing a role there. And that's having a sustained impact on capacity issues as well when it comes to biolimits. Global EV sales are expected to increase at least sixfold by 2030. And the market share of new vehicles for electric vehicles will, will increase between 62% to 86% year on year as well. Uh, Tesla still leads the, the manufacturing market by some distance. However, um, on, the China, on the electric vehicle battery manufacturing side, this is, where, this is where China is really at the forefront and continues to build upon that lead. They obviously have the, um, the advantages they can build at lower cost and they've got the dominance as a supply chain and the raw materials as well, such as lithium and cobalt. Again, this is somewhere where we've seen a very high demand in terms of electric vehicles and uh, the requests and demands on the big car manufacturers and also on the EV battery manufacturers themselves. That's really increased from both a corporate demand and a financial institution demand in the last four to five years and will continue to increase, obviously, on the sizable level in the next four to five years. Cooperation between uh, the private market and, its and ECAs, that's, that's really been, um, hasn't been that frequent, um, I would say in the last sort of five to 10 years. However, I can probably see that increasing again, based on the demand and based on the limit sizes that we're seeing here from both the domestic consumption perspective and also from the export side as well. Um, it's as when you're looking at more um, more challenging markets, such as some of those in South America and Africa, I think some of the ECAs are sometimes better placed to, to sell into those markets. However, the private insurers are coming up with capacity sometimes where it's needed as well. So I think there will be more 
uh, cooperation between those two groups moving forward in the next couple of years. And that's really based on the requirement from the market and also the increased dominance of Asia and Asia Pacific in, uh, in the trade credit space as well. If you look at um, just for example, in terms of comparison, the area for um, the private credit insurance for um, Switzerland, Germany, and Austria is roughly the same size as the overall market for both the, pro well, for the private market um, across all of the private insurers in Asia Pacific. So it gives you an idea of market penetration and the amount of ability for growth that's going to take place in Asia Pacific over the next five to 10 years in that area. Uh, the last point was in terms of the influence of digitalization. More and more the demand from, from clients, from policyholders, and indeed from prospects as well as for instantaneous decisions. And we've seen that the private market insurers have increased their automated uh, decisions going up to a certain amount from a very small threshold to a certain uh, much higher amount in the last couple of years. And that amount will continue to be pushed upwards as we move forward. If a request is coming in for say $25 million or $50 million on a certain name, obviously that's going to have, still have to go to an individual risk specialist to underwrite and assess in detail. However, when we're looking at any upwards of 5 million in the next couple of years, more and more of those decisions will be made on an automated basis, given that the volume of limited inquiries and the requests coming in will increase exponentially as well. Treasurers, CFOs, CEOs will need to see those decisions um, on the smartphones and in real time on an ongoing basis. And we'll have to assess those portfolios as well. And I think here, because Asia is so advanced in terms of usage of smartphones and in terms of digitalization, that requirement for salespeople to go in and see a prospect and go and see a buyer and to assess the grade that the private insurers are outlining for those particular buyers will only increase in the next in a short period of time, so within the next 12 to 18 months. And we certainly see the demand for digitalization here to be more advanced than it is, I believe, in Western Europe. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so we've heard from all of our speakers now, our panel members. We now have some time for questions, about 20, 15 minutes to 20 minutes left. Um, Please feel free to add some questions into the chat box. Um, I do have some, and I think I'll start with, um, excuse the way I pronounce your name. It's not done intentionally, it's just my accent. Um, Shakilesh Appa has asked the question, well, while the potential and requirement for trade credit insurance is present, what is the reach of trade credit insurance in Asia today? Maybe Chloe and Tyler, if you can, Tyler, maybe if you start and Chloe, if you can add lip on the back of that would be useful. Sure, in, in terms of the reach, in terms of the countries, Hugh? Yeah, I think so, and, and just the product itself, I would, I would assume, yeah. Okay, so yeah, in terms of the number of countries, so across Asia, Asia Pacific, the, the private insurers are present in approximately 14 countries. Uh, there are some larger countries that I would say are on the cusp in terms of these could be assessed in the next, I would say, five to seven years. Um, someone like Sri Lanka springs to mind. Um, obviously, there's been some issues uh, in the last 12 years in that particular country. But given the importance um, that it can bring and obviously its proximity to the likes of India, I think someone like Sri Lanka or Cambodia as well will come into play in the next five to six years. Um, where we see the insurers being present at this moment in time, um, they are really looking to expand their presence in some of the larger markets, such as China and India. Uh, and that footprint, when you're looking at market penetration, it's probably less than 1% in China and less than 5% in India. And when you compare that to Western countries where the level, levels of penetration of the product are probably close to around about 40%, if you look at the UK, France, Italy, uh, Netherlands, for example, and then there's a lot of scope for growth here and the level of resources that the private insurers have in place at the moment is barely touching the surface in these countries. Obviously, they're located in the main cities. So in China, you've got uh, the likes of Shanghai, Beijing, um, Shenzhen. Um, but then obviously you're missing out and you're looking at some very large manufacturing industrial areas outside of those big 
um, economic hubs that they'll look to expand into and grow in the next couple of years as well. Um, Chloe, did you want to add on to that? Sure, certainly. Yeah. Um, so from uh, Alliance Trade's perspective, we are present in over these 14 countries that like Tyler mentioned. Uh, we have big presence in China. Uh, we also uh, have our regional hubs in Hong Kong and, and Singapore, which are the main gateway uh, to uh, North Asia and covering Southeast Asia. Uh, in terms of uh, capability, we have uh, each offices, uh, one third of the um, staffs are focusing on risk and credit risk underwriting. Uh, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, that we do see potential, a lot of potential growth uh, in the Asia Pacific market. Um, we are investing also uh, in India. Uh, we are um, putting in more people in India, especially focusing in credit risk underwritings. And we are also looking at um, uh, Vietnam and uh, perhaps followed by Indonesia. But uh, uh, based on uh, the development and the GDP growth and uh, the potential we see in this area, we are constantly in investing. Uh, from the group perspective, uh, we see, uh, you know, outside of Asia is America is the biggest growth market, but then uh, a Asia Pacific is uh, uh, what we are focusing on investing and, and growth uh, uh, in this area. Just, just to, uh, I was going to say, sorry, Hugh, just to add on to that. So the, the range of products that the insurers, the private market insurers have been able to offer has really grown out from the traditional whole turnover coverage over the last couple of years. Mm. Uh, and that's been really based on the level of investment that the insurers have put into the region. Um, for them, it's really the growth market within their global portfolio. It's a growth region for the private insurers and the level of uh, potential to actually grow here even further is exponential. Um, so they'll continue to invest here and the level of flexibility as well that you see from the insurers has certainly changed mm -hmm. in my 10 years that I've been here in the region. The, the insurers themselves have become much more flexible in terms of the structure, in terms of the risk underwriting. So I think now we're, we're really at the, I would say the height of where the credit insurers are and they've really developed and, and grown from where they were 10 years ago. Yeah, maybe adding on to Tyler's comments is to, uh, apart from the uh, whole portfolio and uh, diversifying to single risk or uh, selective buy risk, uh, uh, something to, to uh, not to neglect is the uh, banking uh, policies as well. Uh, Asia being the financial hubs, especially Hong Kong and Singapore, uh, we have been developing a wide range of uh, finance related policies and supporting uh, financial institution. Uh, we do see, even though these two years, because of the shift in the supply chain and overstocking issues, uh, there's a slowdown in the requirements, but we expect and we anticipate that this will come back uh, into uh, normal uh, in the next 12 months. Okay, thank you. So I think there's, there's two questions here, but I'm going to put it into one and see who wants to answer it. So. Um, how do we address the market to improve the reach of trade credit insurance and what actions are you taking as a broker or as, a, as an insurer, etc. And also, how are you seeing the diversification away from the whole tunnel of product that you mentioned, Chloe, to, to the excess of loss product? Are, you, are companies becoming more sophisticated? Are they ready for a full-blown excess of loss product? And I know that's an open question. It depends on the size of the company. But what's, um, what's your view on this? Anybody? Can I, can I, yeah, I'll just, I'll just jump in on, on how do we grow the, the market? How do we grow um, sort of... The visibility of the product as well i think a lot of it is just cue it's from education it's from seminars it's from events like this uh, and having companies whether it be a corporate or whether it be a financial institution understand how the product works the benefits of the product what it can bring to a company uh, and you know we, we work with a product that is effectively helping a company or helping a financial institution grow uh, grow and, and and make uh, make more profits effectively and, and securely as well I think that's often underplayed um, and I think it's something that um, some companies don't really look at as well. 40%, up to 40% of a company's accounts receivable, um, account, sorry, assets can be accounts receivables. Um, companies won't have their main other investments like um, or main other assets, for example, like their property or, or ignore 
um, ignore their DNO as well. So to ignore effectively 40% of their assets and not have that insured at any one time is something that I think a lot of companies will probably need to and want to reassess um, in the future as well. But I think just having companies understand uh, the product a little bit more or more in detail will help. And the companies here, whether it's uh, in the guise of an insurer or in my role as a broker, it's really up to us to continue to get the message out and to grow the market in that in that vein. Yeah, so adding on, uh, just uh, coming back to the educational piece, uh, we, we've seen, because uh, we focus, so my team is focusing on the multinational business. Uh, so historically, large enterprises, they are quite sophisticated. Um, they have, you know, uh, the, the planning in terms of how to best leverage a TCI. With that said, we still see uh, companies in a less mature market um, of understanding TCI uh, would need uh, more of the exchange in terms of how they can leverage the product to benefit them at the most. Um, introducing XOL, I mentioned earlier, it's something that um, we we see a very well received uh, by some of the market like Japan, Australia. Um, this is something we see there's potential um, because of the you know responses to to the product into the market. And uh, e-commerce, I mentioned. Uh, e-commerce is, is, is the future, right? Um, a lot of businesses are conducting online and we see you know, a, a huge potential in terms of the market space. And this is where something we can all grow together and each company has specific requirements based on the business model. And this is where we can work with our partners and the partner brokers and the clients together to design and a product solution from it. So it's exciting era, actually, we see because we, we can, uh, we see a lot of uh, potential uh, in this market in Asia. And we definitely are going to um, uh, create and uh, customize these product solutions um, along the way. Thank you, Chloe. Um, so, Kalisan, there's a question for you. I don't know how you can answer it, uh, or if you can. More than one in 10 people in Japan are aged 80 or over. Almost a third of its population is over 65. So that's an estimated 36 million. With Japan already facing a labor shortage, do you envisage a relaxation of the strict immigration laws or, or will Japan risk a shortage of workers in the future? Thank you very much. So thank you for uh, the question uh, also. So I'll try to answer the question. So yes, uh, actually, so the uh, risk of short, short, shortage of the worker is uh, uh, actually so uh, this is a serious problem uh, Japan, Japan is facing with. And uh, the first approach is uh, uh, in Japan is uh, it seems uh, simply say that uh, uh, my generation and the younger generation need to work longer than the higher generation. So the, now the companies, uh, some companies, the listed company to start the, the company rule uh, for the uh, on the retirement age on the, uh, uh, or retirement age on the position uh, which we can work uh, which, which enable the employee can stay the similar position, the higher uh, position uh, as uh, previous uh, uh, year. So it means that we can work uh, for the longer uh, uh, year at the same position. This kind of the international internal regulation uh, rule is now introducing in the company. And also the yes uh, answer to answer uh, question. So. Now, uh, of course, the uh, Japanese government also the discussing uh, uh, and uh, starting the, the, uh, the relaxing of the strict immigration law. But uh, it seems that uh, in the future, uh, yes, uh, I think so. But uh, in the near future, it's still my opinion. In my opinion, it still takes time uh, to change the uh, strict immigration laws uh, into the more to more relaxed. That's my understanding. Maybe in the future. Okay, Kathleen, we haven't forgot about you. Um, is there sufficient insurance reinsurance capacity for trade credit insurance, and how do we ensure the availab the availability remains, and we do not lose out to other insurance disciplines such as property, for example? Okay. 
Um, thank you for this very interesting question, which we have been facing, uh, I think during, especially during the last uh, renewals. Um, and for me, there are a few uh, key factors, um, um, is that we continue to do what we do best. Um, some of them are, like I mentioned, active and agile risk and limit uh, management, taking adaptive measures to the situation, and of course, offering reasonable coverage uh, in order to stay relevant to the trading sector especially in times of crisis like COVID. Um, and of course, to me, um, most importantly is besides stable performance, um, is also to provide reasonable margin and terms to the reinsurer. So um, yes, no doubt, competition with other lines of business, especially what we have seen, the property net cat rate is hardening, but um, not forgetting retro purchase for these lines is also hardening and expensive at the same time. So at the end of the day, I think reinsurer also need to diversify and balance their portfolio to avoid concentration. So my, my answer to, to that question, the long and short of it is yes, there will be competition, but so long as we, say, we stay resilient, disciplined and provide sustainable margin and terms um, in the market, we can go a long way. Thank you. Yep. Okay, I think I've got time for one last question and I'll throw this to everybody on the panel. What are a client's expectations of credit insurance in this region? So what's the client looking for from their credit insurance? We talk about the products, we talk about how we deliver, but what does the client actually, what are they looking for? Tyler, you're the broker, you can educate us first before we can disagree. <laughs> Thanks, Hugh. Um... As much coverage as possible on their portfolio at the most competitive pricing. And then to get all their claims paid if there are any claims submitted, of course. And I think I think the claims payment side is important. We've obviously seen a very benign claims environment over the last three years during COVID and, and at the back of COVID as well. Um, we all, well, I think we're all under the assumption that that will change um, if not next year maybe 2025 given the given the various economic headwinds um, but I think yeah that's something that the best thing and the best promoter of the product is when claims are paid and when they're paid quickly um, that obviously helps to to really expand the overall portfolio within the region and, and to grow the market successfully and I think that's what we're all here to do maybe yeah, I can add on I'll come to you, Chloe. You wait, wait your turn. Kind <laughs> of son. What, do, what does the client expect from credit insurance? Yeah, for I think the the uh, we had uh, for large client for large uh, large corporate is a uh, a capacity, I believe. So, uh, and uh, uh, response to the uh, how to say the export credit size and uh, and now. Uh, under the current uh, geopolitical tensions. This is the expect expectation from the large corporate. For the small size, mid small and medium size ent entity, it, it corporate, so I think the, the simple uh, product is the uh, expectation uh, to the our industry. So a bit uh, our product, normal uh, standard product is a bit uh, complicated uh, to the uh, small and medium size uh, corporate clients. That's, that's all. I think you have a, a view on this. You're on mute. All right, we're running out of time. Chloe, to close us out, any no comments? Sure, certainly. I think apart from the price and cover that Tyler mentioned earlier, uh, we see customer really appreciating uh, the value added service to the business. Uh, in the space of a multinational business, uh, clients like the, um, the the product solution brings value to uh, in the compliance, um, the ease of administrations, uh, have visibility of the global uh, uh, credit situation uh, with their subsidiaries. And also uh, from, from our servicing, we have a dedicated team who constantly having conversation and dialogue on exchange on where it's lacking in terms of capacity, where they are growing in terms of market. Uh, this is uh, all the value added service our clients are appreciating. Um, echoing uh, Tyler, uh, uh, just talk about in terms of claim, definitely when it comes to claim, um, 
we do see the number of claims and, and, and the amount are increasing and we forecast insolvency will jump to 20 1% in 2023 and 4% by 2024. So not just having a peace of mind, but when it comes to a uh, losses uh, situation, a uh, client needs to have a trusted partner to make sure claims paid. Um, that will be my conclusion. And in fact, uh, we, uh, we have some figures uh, for the last uh, eight months that we are paying actually more than 54% uh, in Asia compared to last year. This is important for clients to be aware uh, because uh, coming into uh, uh, partnering and selecting TCI uh, services. Excellent. Thank you. Guys, we are now at the end. That was a quick hour. So thank you all for your, your comments and your opinion and your participation. It, it takes a, a lot of time to prepare for these things, so I do appreciate it. And now I will pass it to Richard to, to close out the session. Richard, back over to you. Well, thank you so much, Hugh, and thank you so much to all the speakers. I think this was an extremely interesting uh, webinar. There was a lot, a lot of attention paid. Nobody dropped off, which is always a good sign. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks to the audience for being there and for your thought-provoking questions. Uh, any other questions for the speakers, you can drop via our website, icsa.org, or to the email address secretariat at icsa.org, and we'll make sure that they go to the speakers. There have been a number of questions that we didn't have the, uh, the possibility to answer. I will, uh, I will put those to the speakers as well. Now, a reminder, that this webinar can be seen on our website uh, afterwards. Um, you can also see the earlier webinars of this week already. And you might want to show them to your colleagues because things might be really, really interesting. And I think this one was. It was heartening to see that there is development in Asia. There is There are a lot of opportunities. And I saw a lot of optimism which we sometimes lack in old Europe. So thank you all the speakers for that little ray of sunshine. Our next and last item of this TCI week is this afternoon uh, at 2 p.m. UK time, 3 p.m. CET, 9 in Hong Kong, Singapore, and 10 in Tokyo. And we'll be discussing the re-emergence of political risk and its implications on the TCI sector. We'll have the pleasure of hearing two underwriters, a researcher, a broker, moderated by a highly specialized journalist. We hope to see you then. And for now, this is Isisa signing off from Schiphol Airport in the Netherlands, thanking you all. Bye-bye now. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye.